Namaste, everyone. Welcome to Federation of Canada Nepal Chambers of Commerce, FCNCC presents CEO and Executive Series. FCNCC aims to connect and create business opportunities. This series is a forum where leaders and executives talk and share about their knowledge, experience, expertise, and inspires all of us. This is your moderator, Isha Subedi, and we are currently live from CanadaCupboard.com's Facebook page. You can also watch all of our recorded live session in FCNCC's page and its YouTube page. For today's guest, we have very inspirational Muga Raj Pandari. He is a highly accomplished entrepreneur, social activist, and visionary leader whose contributions span across multiple businesses and organizations. Um, as a founder of CEO of MedVisa and Organ um, Immigration Service, he has facilitated the dreams of numerous individuals seeking to immigrate in Canada. Alongside his role as a uh, president of Coin Venture Inc., Gray J Inc., and Logistic Room Inc., he has demonstrated a keen business um, and fosters innovation within various industry. Welcome to the show, Mugashar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah, we are very glad to have you here. Um, and we would like to begin by knowing on how, um, why did you decide to choose Canada and how was your initial days when you started here? Uh, thank you very much for letting me explain about what happened, why I am here right now in Canada. It is very, very interesting story. Um, initially, I never thought that I was going to go to abroad or Canada or anywhere else. Yes. Uh, I was born in the remote village of Nepal, Solukumbu, where I have seen lots of people were suppressed. Uh, they were poor. Um, it was hard life for them. And uh, since the very beginning, I was thinking to become a lawyer and help them out because they were very, very exploited there. That is why I finished my law degree. And after finishing my law degree in Nepal at that time, we did not have any master's degree of law in Nepal. So I had no choice other than changing the subject to the uh, psychology and political science. So I finished at the same time, I was working with the uh, international organization called SNB Nepal. Uh, that is the consulate of Dutch government, uh, Netherlands government. Uh, I had a pretty good life there, good salary, everything looked good. In the meantime, I was practicing law because by the time I became a lawyer. And somehow I got the opportunity to fill up the form and uh, apply for a Canadian PR. And I got that eventually. And then my boss from the Netherlands was also very nice. He let me go for three months. I came to Canada and coming here, I thought maybe it's better for me. Yeah. So I forgot everything, whatever I dreamt of to help Nepalese people in my village. And I moved to Canada. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, great to hear. But you are indirect, uh, like you are also helping Nepali people even now. Um, so from a small village in Nepal, and now you're an owner of multiple business contributing to a multiple um sectors um can you um expand more on the companies that you have and what you what they do okay sure uh, definitely i will share my knowledge whatever i learned from um and still there are so many things i need to learn but it's, it's the like process so coming to canada actually i was supposed to come to toronto yeah. because i was selected federally but because of my couple of friends who were in montreal i landed there and then as soon as I landed in Montreal, it was completely different. I felt that because they were speaking French language, stuff like that. So I decided to stay there. But before doing so, I went to the immigration, whether if I can stay there or not, then they allowed me to do so. So I learned French. I did not start my business immediately. I started working as soon as I finished my course, I got the job. It was a decent job until 2015. Uh, I was one of the executives in the big company uh, that was the US-based company. So I was working for them. And since the very beginning, I wanted to do something by myself. Uh, back in the days, I think in 2000, we even opened a restaurant where we were selling all Nepalese food. 
but because of bad partner, I had to stop that. Uh, in 2011, where that is the year I think I was fully involved and I also encouraged lots of community people to be their own boss. So to do so, it, at the time it was not easier because not all people were, were settled well. So what we did is, uh, talking about the coin venture that you just named it, uh, we established coin venture, uh, but it was different model. It was um, collective investment model. Mm -hmm. So we started collecting just a hundred dollars a month. Yes. We were, I think, thirty nine people investing in that. After investing a year, we didn't collect that much money. Thirty nine hundred per month is what? Not even uh, fifty thousand, less than fifty thousand. So I requested them to invest a little bit more and invest in the real estate property, which we did. Um, that was happening in 2013, I believe. And by 2019 or 20, um, it, it went like 350% profit we made. So that gave us luxury to pay our down payment for everyone. So that was a big achievement we had. Uh, from that, we learned so many things and uh, we have established uh, MDS Visa Immigration Services back in 2015 in Quebec, Montreal. Then I moved to uh, Toronto in 2016. Then we started here too. And gradually we started involving in different uh, organizations. We established Grazer Inc, um, uh, Coin Venture, uh, and then the Logistic Room. Uh, we have a couple of different companies, but actively I'm in uh, MDS Visa Immigration Services. Okay, um, and so MDS Visa Immigration, what, um, what inspired you to start it? Um, and can you tell us where it is located and how can people reach out to you if they are interested to get in contact with you? Absolutely. Like I said, my story, since the very beginning, I wanted to help people legally because that is what I thought. And even if I couldn't do anything in Nepal, since I landed here, I started helping lots of people who wanted to immigrate to Canada. Uh, including refugee, uh, stu study permit, uh, PR, sponsorship, everything before even becoming uh, professional. So 2013, I went to school, got the license. And 2015, we started this from Montreal. We still have branch office in Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, we have head office in Mississauga, Toronto, I mean, here, Ontario. We have office in uh, Kathmandu, but it is uh, non a little bit different name. Uh, we have different. We use different name. That is Parsala Education Network, which is located in Banasur. Mm -hmm. We recently established another branch in Bhutan as well. So we are slowly expanding and uh, trying to do our best. Yeah, and that's great. And um, so you said that uh, Coin Venture made three fifty percent profit. Then you're expanding Med Visa. You've been working in different industry in different sector, and you've been making a lot of profit and you've been expanding everything. What do you think is like a secret to a successful business? Um, sorry, let me correct you. Uh, let me correct myself because I said Coin Venture, the 350% profit, that is not the Coin Venture, that is Humro IFB Inc. Okay. That is Initiative for Better Life, we, we said that. Mm -hmm. So that is established in Montreal. That is the company made 350. Maybe I used Coin Venture, but that is not the right. It is. It was Humro. Uh, well, at the time we had no choice because we were not ready to take big risk. And looking at the real estate that was booming, and that is something we could afford at the time. That it was kind of uh, not our desire. It is compulsion to invest in that uh, business, but it went well at the end. So everybody are happy right now. Um, based on that learning and the success, as soon as I came to Mont I mean, Toronto, lots of people insisted me to establish the similar company and let's start investing. Here in Coin Venture, we did not collect $100 a month. We collected like lump sum amount. Exactly. And then I uh, started investing in real estate. And I always, always dreamt of promoting something from Nepal. So from the very beginning, Momo's, uh, 
is the famous one in Nepal. So that is what I wanted to do. Not only selling momos in a restaurant environment, we wanted to become a producer and distributor so we can reach out to lots of restaurants, retail stores. So we can go like further. And this opportunity will not only help my team where we are, it helps everyone who wants to do that. There's no competition for us. And this is our food we know very well compared to other people. And that is what uh, we did in 2020, just before COVID on February, we established Momos and Tacos Restaurant. Uh, it was the sister company of Point Venture Inc. Mm -hmm. And then we started that. But after a month, COVID happened. So we had to shut down for three, four months. That was not a good news. And we were thinking whether we can restart or not, but luckily we were able to restart that business. And then slowly, gradually, people started knowing it. Um, I still can remember when I went to restaurant at the time, they used to sell momos, but the name was Dumplings. And our team uh, advocated that, no, it's not Dumpling, it's momos. Dumpling is, it, it's a similar, same, same, probably different taste from China or Japan or Korea. They also sell dim sum or dumplings, they say that. So we wanted to market this as a momos. So maybe we have made some changes, not only us, everyone who are involved in this business. Now, if you go to different restaurants, you can see it is written momos now, not dumplings anymore. And they don't even hesitate Nepali to say Nepali test. So somehow we made a little bit of changes in the marketplace to call our food as a momos. And lots of people are involved. Still, I'm saying there's no competition there. So long as you can produce quality food, tasty food, we don't need to worry. We need so many people in this business. Yes. So yeah. I'm encouraging everyone who ever want to do this business, but only thing I want to aware and warn them is if you do, do it correctly. Don't mess it out. Because I recall those carpet factory, those garment factory back in the days because of those duplicate uh, not, uh, quality, bad quality. That's how it was ruined at the time. So we want to do better and promote this food everywhere in Canada, not only in Canada, across North America. Yes, and then we appreciate you making change and making sure that the food of Nepal is recognized, not yes. just in Canada, but everywhere. Um, now that you've um, contributed so, in so many business, so many sectors, what do you think is uh, your secret in a successful business? What do you think somebody should do if they're looking to start a new business? Well, becoming an entrepreneur or to become an entrepreneur, not an easy job, right? It's, it takes lots of passion, lots of energy, uh, the financial stuff as well. So you've got to be careful when you start. But um, uh, when COVID happened, I think one thing that better happened was um, I read somewhere about 2 million people started business during that time. Why that happened is some people maybe started getting government assistance. They not, don't need to worry about day-to-day -day life and they can focus whatever they wanted to do. Um, anyways, lots of entrepreneurs were there. And again, another thing I saw, which is a little bit scary part, is one third of those business will not sustain five years. And maybe 50% of the business will be collapsed in 10 years time. So that risk, that is very good um, uh, lesson to learn. So if we want to be successful, we need to devote our time. We need to learn every day because there are technology every day there, right? If you cannot grab that, you cannot be successful. So there are so many things you need to learn. You need to manage your time. You need to manage your family time. And business time there are so many things uh, you need to do but now we are doing it lots of people are doing it it's not impossible it is possible you just need to know how to yeah so i definitely encourage everyone if you are willing to do something on your own do it this is the right time especially i want to say our younger generation let, let's say our kids here who were born here or who were immigrated here when they're young 
there are so many government assistance to do so. At least if you want to do something 35, 40, less than 50K, you can get immediately. So there's no risk. You have parents who is backing you up. So you don't need to go and look for a job for a few dollars and do something. But if you really want to do, this is the right time. And I saw last time, I think uh, last week or a week before, one of our young uh, entrepreneur uh, came out. I was so happy. Uh, I want so many people like that here. And yes, it, it can be done. Yes, and we also would want a lot of like youth entrepreneurs yeah. to come out and not only recognize Nepal, but then also do well. And then we also wish you a lot of success. We hope you keep on recognizing Nepal and keep on doing well. Um, a lot of our viewers are also interested to know about immigration because a lot of people are not aware about um, the services you provide. Um, and what can be done or what ways they can apply. So what are the different ways you can come to Canada? Well, talking about the immigration, there are hundreds of different ways to come to Canada, but it doesn't mean all those hundred options are um, equally fit to everyone who are wishing to come to Canada. It's different, right? Uh, we have federal program that is looking at uh, how old are you? What is your experience? Uh, what is your highest level of education? Whether you are married or not, what is your language proficiency? All those. If you get higher score, then you will be selected. If you talk, we, we talk about the province, then um, sometimes, uh, most of the time, they have their own program. Some of them are linked to federal, some of them are not. So they are also looking at, uh, they have the priority list as well. It depends every province. So Basically, if you are planning to come to Canada, then obviously you need to have some sort of degree, you need to have the language, you need to have some at least one year skilled work experience, otherwise you cannot come. So I can go to all those 100 different options, but uh, I've been talking every day, I'm coming getting over 100 people, right? I'm advising them, I'm telling them what to do, what not to do, what is right for them, what is not right for them. And there are so many scammers in the market these days. I spent at least an hour or two just saying, yeah, this is fake. This is good. This is bad. This don't do this. Don't invest on this. I just waste my money that way. And I even started telling people, don't ask me this anymore. If you don't know why this visa came to your home, then it is obviously fake. Yeah. Right. If you haven't even applied for a job and somebody is telling you, hey, you've got a job, then it's a fake. If you haven't started the process, then if you get something, it's obviously fake. So we need to be careful uh, on these. And there are so many people in Nepal come going from different countries, um, telling them that they are the authentic one. And there are so many websites that they are saying, you don't need uh, any experience, you don't need language, no uh, okay, education, everything like that. There's nothing uh, such immigration options in Canada, so don't go behind that. Uh, if you really want to do, do research by on your own, in Canada, there's an immigration official website where you can see all these options, whatever I was, I'm talking about or I'm going to talk about. So you can see that maybe if you don't have enough English, like I said before, you can even Google it, translate it, try to get um, what exactly they are saying. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do that, and if you think investing money, paying money, you get the visa, then I would say 99% of you are going to be in a difficult situation. You yeah. are just investing money for nothing. Um, yeah, I was um I was also gonna bring up the scams and frauds that happens in immigration. We be offer letters or we be consultancies doing it. Do you um apart from doing your own research, is there any way we are able to reduce it or like report it somewhere? What can be done? What can be done to avoid the fraud and scams? Yeah, you can definitely report to the immigration uh, uh, CBSA. There's a detailed website how to report those people. But the process to take action against them is really slow. It is very frustrating. Okay. Uh, what Canada has done is to do immigration, we need to have the license to do that. Without license, you cannot do that. That being said, 
lawyers from Canada and immigration consultant who are regulated uh, mm -hmm. by the college immigration of college of immigration they can practice this but that is within Canada people from outside Canada they don't know this mm -hmm. and even if they know hiring Canadian professionals costs a little bit more compared to the local people so most people might prefer, ah, why should we go there? Let's hire local people. And those local, local people, um, not all, some of them don't even know about anything about immigration, but they are advising people. What I have found is people have master's degree and wanted to come to Canada to study postgraduate or another master's. They were advising, hide your master's degree. Don't say that, you will not get visa. And just show your battles and go to Canada. Mm. And at the end of the day, when they come here, when it is time for them to apply for PR, how do they prove they have master's degree? They have already hided that. Yeah. And there are so many immigration uh, uh, decisions we have seen because of misrepresentation. They were banned for two to five years. So it is very risky. So I always ask people, when you want to get advice, get from the professionals. It might cost a little bit of money, but it worth. Or go by yourself and do research. You can do it. It's not a rocket science. Anybody could do it so long as you know what you are doing and yeah. you try to get the information. Yeah, and I hope uh, we are able to make more people aware for anybody watching on the dangers of the fraud and hope they do their research and only uh, seek for help with professionals. Um, you have been in the immigration sector for such a long time. Um, do you think there are any policy that needs to be changed or in, uh, anything that needs to be improved on a government level? What do you suggest? Yes, uh, we've been talking so much about this and uh, we have our own organization, organization where we can raise our voice, um, such as KPIC and other organizations. Uh, we really desperately waiting for this category-based drop. We've been advising them. We've, we've been talking about that since 2019. What, hap what is happening in Canada, everybody's seen it. Uh, they are selecting the people who ever get the higher score, right? Right now it is 483, depending on the category, 4, 468, everything like that. So what happens is people have PhD degree or master's degree, they have different background, one year experience, they are the one coming here. And mm -hmm. once they land in Canada, they are not able to find a job what, on their field. And they becoming, a doctor is coming here and becoming a taxi driver. I'm not insulting you, they don't need to be taxi driver, but mm -hmm. since they invested on those degree, then they should get similar uh, job in similar field, right? Yeah, they are taxi driver, truck driver. They want to come here. There are plenty of jobs, but they are not going to be selected because they don't have that big qualification and they cannot get that many score. So we've been always advising the government, hey, let's do the category based. Mm -hmm. Finally, it is happening. Last week, I think uh, 2,000 uh, health worker people selected. And IT people, there's lots of demand in IT people in Canada. They started that 500. So moving forward, we can see it. And French speaking people, they, they just selected, they always wanted to promote French speaking people, but they're going to the pool, compete with other people, not enough score. Mm -hmm. So they have this category based, this, which is very good. It should continue. And another thing I didn't see, like lots of people are looking for cook, um, mm -hmm. plumber, housekeeper, but these people are not on those category lists. When I saw that, I was so frustrated. I was hoping to see it because we've been helping lots of employers here to do the LMIA application. Uh, that means if somebody wants to hire from outside of Canada, they need to go through this process, get the approval from the government, and then they can hire. We've been doing a lot of this. If these people were in that category base, yeah. uh, then it would be much more easier for them, easier for employer, uh, so maybe we are going to uh, advocate that part a little bit, but we want to wait and see how, what type of people are going to be selected once they land here, whether they are going to get a job uh, related to their study or the experience. And based on that, we might come up with some different ideas too. And government is also testing so many different 
uh, immigration options, which works better. But uh, looking at the entire scenario, the point-based system uh, is working very well and other countries are also trying to copy that idea. So yes. I think uh, immigration is going well, uh, but you never know every quarter, every month, uh, there are so many changes in the immigration. So we need to be up to date. We need to study a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's great. And um, so uh, you have been contributing to the sector for a long time. Um, for a newcomer in Canada who wants to follow the same path as you, um, what are the pro what are the certification process they have to get to in order to start an immigration business? Okay, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy and quick. I think uh, back in the days when I studied, it was one year course full time. Now they made it two years, mm -hmm. and anybody any college could uh, provide this course, but no longer that case right now. I think only one university is going to do this. Um, they can. Uh, on, from COVID time, I think they can even study online. I'm not sure about that. But whatever the case, they need to finish the course. Once they pass uh, for the licensing, they need to have they need to go to the uh, English language test. I think it's a little bit higher. If you don't have good English, then it might be difficult. But all the younger generation, they have good English. I think they need to get listening eight and the rest of the band seven. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm just guessing because I've done a long time ago and I forgot and at the time maybe it was not like that. Uh, so once you study and pass the licensing exam, then you can become a regulated immigration consultant. Uh, once you become every year, you need to have certain CPD hours. Uh, that is 16 hours you need to go and study or if you have done anything but on your own you need to get certified for that hours to claim uh, so you need to continue study still um, but uh, it's not a big deal you can do it within two years and uh would you um for the time being would you know which canadian city or province or uh, nepalese community they find easier to settle in canada um especially in terms of job and education or well, obviously, big cities have lots of jobs and opportunity, but sometimes it does not work for everyone, right? Uh, what I have seen recently and every day, at least I get five to 10 calls from these people saying, hey, uh, I finished my plus two from Nepal and came to Canada studying in Ontario. Uh, now it looks like Ontario is impossible for us. Where should I go? Right? Uh, that looks straightforward questions, but uh, answer is different. It really depends what you have done in the past and what you are going to do or what you have studied. So depending on that, I always suggest, yes, obviously not for everyone. I wouldn't say 100%, maybe 95% people should move from the uh, province of Ontario if you have just plus two. So now where to go, right? So look at the immigration options. If you look at the Atlantic Provincial Nominee Program, it has completely different requirements compared to other, other pro, uh, immigration program. Uh, there are four different provinces, um, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, New, uh, Newfoundland, and Prince Edward Island. They have the, this Atlantic Provincial Nominee Program. If you find a job there, and if you have one year's experience, either back from home or uh, in Canada, and if the employer is uh, R or is designated, and if you get a job from those people, those employers, you can apply PR and work permit as well. And most of you, means plus two students, already have postgraduate work permit. If you have studied one year, probably you have one year work um, postgraduate work permit. If you have studied two years, then you have uh, at least three years uh, postgraduate work permit. So you don't need to obtain for the work permit to work. You already have it. But once you have the one year experience, then you can apply PR. So that could be easier uh, program and provinces to go. I don't know if they can find a job or not. It's a different story. Uh, and other than that, like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, even Alberta, it's better. In Saskatchewan, if you go there and if you work, uh, sorry, in Manitoba, six months, then you can apply PIA through that provincial nominee program. Yeah. But one thing you need to be careful, 
in those provinces, they want you to work in the similar field that you have studied. Mm -hmm. So yeah. understand all these. And then before even moving, I always tell them, look for a job from here. Just don't quit the job here and go there just for the sake of getting PR. It could be difficult. Some people moved already and they're not finding the job for three months. It is hard. So try to find from here, so long as you are in Canada, they don't um, discriminate you. Hey, you are in the province of Ontario, I don't hire you. They don't say that. If you're eligible, if you're qualified, if you have the knowledge to do so, they will hire. So before moving anywhere, research based on your profile, don't just apply the rule, I have plus two, then I have to go to Atlantic. No, that is not true. Even if you have plus two, you have some experience there and you have two years experience here, your employer is ready to help you. Maybe they can do LMI for you. You can get 50% over there. I mean, 50 points there. And your English is very good. Then you get better points. Maybe you can be selected in Ontario. So yeah. it depends on profession, your degree, what you studied here. Um, so it's not that everyone should move, but first of all, research what you have and how many points you get in Ontario and how many points you get in other provinces. Based on that, you can move. Yeah, and that's very informative for all of our viewers watching. I hope they're doing their research and uh, seeking help. Um, so immigrants here uh, represent uh, close to half, 46.6% of total population in Toronto. Is there any data about Nepalese immigrants in Canada? Any percentage, any number? Well, we do not have that. We do have the immigration data, uh, but that does not represent all Nepalese. Mm -hmm. uh, I think NRA in Canada started doing something, even the Embassy of Nepal uh, was also involved in that, but I haven't seen those data. But definitely the most, I mean, the most people are living in Ontario and then maybe Alberta, BC and other provinces. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have uh, data to tell you. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, you brought up NRNA, so I also wanted to know, uh, you are a founding member of ANQ. You have contributed to NRNA Canada. You have um, also Room to Read that promotes literacy and education for children in low-income countries. Would you like to elaborate and let us know more about the work that you do? Absolutely. Yeah, beside my professional work, I am heavily involved and in uh, involving these days too in social service as well. Um, if you look back when I was uh, on seventh grade, I was a president of one of the club in uh, Solokongu, which is the best um, club, I mean, the social organization is still these days. So coming from very young age, involving in the social services, uh, coming to Canada, when I came to Montreal, there was nothing about Nepalese organization. There was one, but not active. So coming to uh, Montreal, we have established Association of Nepalese in Quebec and Q uh, back in 2020, uh, 2020, uh, how do you say that? 2000, yeah, not 2000, 2000. Uh, since then, I involved in Canadian uh, social service as well. Um, then uh, 2008, I think NRNA uh, established in Canada too. Since the very beginning, I, I involved in that organization as well. I used to be a president or secretary in Montreal. So I never thought I need to have two positions to serve the community. So I never been executive level of NRNA Canada. I never thought of, uh, but locally I've been in so many different organizations. Moving here, I'm actively involved in different a community organization like NCNC and are in Canada. Uh, yeah, I'm trying my best to help you uh, help our community out. And beside that, Room to Read was introduced when I was in Montreal. They were also helping um, the developed, I mean, the underdeveloped country like Nepal, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, South Asian country. Uh, and they were helping for the literacy, for the women's right, all these uh, these stuff. And I really like that since I think 2014, I involved with them. Um, I couldn't do much work for them, but I volunteer. I donate to whatever I could do. 
um, in uh, Toronto, they don't have any brands. So I was not able to actively involve like in Montreal, but I'm also helping them. Yeah, and we thank you for your service. It's great what you do, especially when you're so busy with all of your uh, businesses. Um, I would also like to connect. Um, you also have a logistic room, uh, Inc. That's a settlement service. It might be helpful for a lot of people. Um, can you uh, let us know what you do and how can we reach out for it? Okay. Well, this is another part of the uh, business or help we wanted to do since uh, before even COVID. Uh, when we are involved in immigration sector, we get the clients from across the world. Not, although I'm Nepali and may, many people are thinking maybe I'm just helping Nepalese people, and that is not the case. I, we help people from across the world, no matter where they, they want to come from. Mm -hmm. So lots of people were demanding, hey, can you help on this uh, settlement, uh, maybe finding a room or getting from the airport to their apartment they've been asking and we wanted to establish that company but we were not able to do so because of covid uh, anything all this thing happened during those days and recently we have started this logistic group um, that provides this service to to settle people here uh, connect to the job agency or employer to find the job giving them information about what is their right and what is uh, their um, options here uh, from the government as well. And since the beginning, and still I'm telling those services supposed to be free from uh, government. And it is free for those people who uh, are coming here as a permanent resident. Mm -hmm. They can get these services for free. But although it is free, you need to get an appointment, you need to go there, you need to have that information, and they are not going to help you like individual basis. Yes. Well, they might have the information session, you need to go there and get some information, right? They might have the job help session, you need to go there, they might have to help you prepare the CVs, all these. But what other people, like what those temporary worker or students or other visitors, Canada government is not helping. They, they don't have any service for those people because they are temporary. Mm -hmm. So we, we wanted to focus on those people as well as the permanent people who don't know the information, how to obtain those. So we wanted to guide that through. That is why it was established. Lots of people are busy these days within our organization, so we were not able to focus on that, but it is still going well. Lots of people are coming, lots of people are asking information. Uh, we are helping them, giving them the information or settling them around Canada, wherever they want to do, go. Um, and lots of big uh, companies, uh, they want to do so many things, maybe the trade shows or uh, just the travel or um, different activities here. They are contacting us. Uh, we are helping them out. Um, and lots of students are also contacting us. We know students don't have that much money. But what I'm telling them is, maybe it cost them a couple of hundred dollars getting our services. It's better to have it uh, because so many people fall under the victim of those scammers. Mm -hmm. They have seen, okay, house rent or room rent, they paid for that when coming here, they have nothing here. Yes. And they have no clue where to go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before coming here, research a little bit. You don't need to buy the services. If you do research, if you connect with the people, if you network with the people, they might help you. But established company, professional company established here by Nepali doesn't mean you can expect free service mm -hmm. because we don't get any donation. We don't get any um, uh, revenue from the government. We need to collect from these people. We're trying to create the opportunity, job opportunity for other people. So think that way. Like if this company is running well, maybe 10 people could be hired or get the job, right? So don't expect all is free, free, free. That can be harm, but pay for the fees that is reasonable and professional organization or the individual. Mm -hmm. That is better than going and falling under victims or scammers. Yeah, and uh, especially when you're an international student coming to a new country, it is very difficult. So we are, we appreciate you doing everything for our visitors and students and people who are not um, are aware of the services. I hope they are now. Um, before we let you go, is there any advice you would like to give to newcomers or people starting a new business? 
any advice for them? Well, there's so many things I really wanted to talk, but lots of people know already. But uh, what I, I would like to say is, don't be discouraged. If you have passion to do something, focus on that. Is it easy? No, it is not easier. If I go to work for other people, eight hours maximum, right? And I can count the break. Uh, hey, can you get, I, I mean, that's my right. But when you do on your own thing, you need to work more than 12 hours. I still work from 8 to 10. That is how many hours? 14 hours. <laughs> and I have family. I have friends. I have the community commitment. So many things. So it is not easy to balance it, the time, but still you can do it. So if you have a passion to do something, do it. If you are a newcomer, new student, it might be difficult. You might need to go and look for a job. I have seen lots of people saying, hey, I'm not finding a job. I'm not finding a job. I've been here three months, four months, five months. I'm not finding it. So for those people, I'm not asking you to start the business because you need to focus on your study as well, right? But maybe you can do one thing. That is what I did at the very beginning. And uh, that is what I suggest to lots of people. Easy to find job is on sales. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone. Again, if you know how to sell, try that one. You can get easily. You need to work really hard, but it works. If you don't like, don't touch it. What I did, let me tell you one thing. Uh, the first job I did was sales associate mm -hmm. to sell a vacuum cleaner. That's Electrolux, if you have heard anything. That was my first job. I did not know that it was a selling stuff, anything like that. I went there and then it was an information system, a couple of people, and they said, hey, this is our product. We need to sell this product. If you sell this product, you get 25% commission. And they didn't tell me the price or how much does it cost. It looks lucrative, right? If I sell like $200, then I, at least I, get, I can get $50 in my pocket, which could be an hour job or two hours job. Then at the end, they gave us the training, one full year, a full week training, and then I started that job. And I was able to make $4,300 a week. Forget that money. That is a big chunk of money. People couldn't even at that time make in a month. It could take yeah. longer than that. But what I learned from there is the skill. That you cannot buy. Those skills, I think that is the skill I'm still using it and doing my own different businesses here. So try sales. It is easier to get. They might say maybe the base salary and the commission. Forget the money. Learn the skill. If you do better, you can make money uh, like in the business. You, you can make money a lot within a couple of weeks, months, or something like that. Or sometimes you don't make money for a month. So if you want to take a risk, go with that. And since you are a student, take any job, whatever available right now. I, I told this like several different interviews. It doesn't mean you need to do forever that one. Uh, basically, when if you are a student, as an employer, like let's say myself, I also think temporary, right? You are a student, maybe you might work for three months or four months. That is what, what I think. And you also think the same thing. Hey, I have four months left to finish my study. I need job for this time. But if you do better, you can continue with that company. Um, and even the, you could get better opportunity within that company because you are going to finish your degree by the time you have some experience. And if you have nothing to do, instead of saying, I did not get a job, um, it's bad, everything like that, go volunteer. Yeah. If you get a chance to go into a company as a volunteer, even if for two days, and if you show your skill, they will hire you. I became like a high level executive making six figure salary. It's not like that. I went like you guys whoever going through this process, but I showed them my skills, what I can do for them. In the business like immigration I have, we have settlement company, we have another grade A, wherever you, if you, let's say, I'm not asking you to come and volunteer me. If you get a chance to go there and volunteer, because we are a business company, we look at the revenue, right? Without revenue, we cannot pay the salary. If you come here and show me the revenue, 
then why should I worry to pay your salary? For example, if you are a web designer, let's say, or there are so many apps these days coming in, right? If you are good on that, ask some company, hey, I want to do volunteer for you a month. And if you get a chance, show them what you can do. And if you generate some revenue or if the, you streamline their day-to-day -day process, make it easier, why they can't hire you? They can't hire you. Yeah. Even, even though, let me give you one little example. We have the restaurant, right? As well, we run the restaurant as well. Uh, people, when we ask, do you know how to make momos? Because that is what our product is. And most people say, no. If you don't know, then we don't hire. Some people say, I really want to try because back home, Momo is our food. And I have made so many Momos at home. Okay, then try. People are becoming manager now. People are getting better job doing training from there. So just go into somewhere. Don't, don't waste your time doing nothing. If you have nothing to do, do volunteer. And uh, thank you so much for your wise words. We're almost to the end of the interview. We thank you for your time and thank you for sharing the information and your story. Um, and lastly, we would like to thank all of our viewers joining us live from CanadaCover.com for your continuous love and support. This is Isha Subedi signing off and we will join you again next Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.